This video is to go over various beam propulsion technologies, such as the recently controversial microwave thruster featured on emdrive.com. We'll start with a history of beam propulsion research, then talk a bit about where that technology is at today and where it might be going tomorrow. In his book, Secrets of Anti-Gravity Propulsion, Dr. Paula Violette discusses Project Sky Vault, which was started at Rocketdyne, present-day North American Rockwell Laboratories, as early as the 1940s, when it was discovered that microwave beams could move objects if the object happened to be made out of the right kind of material. The effect was extremely frequency sensitive, and the effect would only occur within certain bands which were specific to each type of material. However, if the frequency was slightly off, the object could suddenly vaporize. The researchers discovered that this was due to the strong electromagnetic resonances that metamaterials have at a specific frequency. Such materials respond to incident microwaves in an unusual way. Take as an example a material that exhibits a resonant response to the electrical component of an electromagnetic wave. Over most frequencies, the material's permittivity will have a positive value, and as a result, the applied electric field will induce a polarization in the same direction of its own field vector. Near the resonance frequency, however, the induced polarization will become very large, the metamaterial's large response being due to its accumulation of energy from the microwave beam over many wave cycles. The energy stored in the resonating medium can then greatly exceed that delivered by the incident driving field. It can be so large that even changing the phase or sign of the incident wave would have little effect on the polarization oscillation. As a result, when the frequency of the incident wave is increased slightly above this resonant frequency, the applied electric field will be out of phase with respect to the induced polarization oscillation, and as a result, the material will respond by exhibiting a negative permittivity. The induced polarization now being out of phase with the applied electric field, and as a result, the electromagnetic wave will exert a repulsive force on the material. Physicists John Pendry and David Smith illustrate this repulsive force in an article from Scientific American where they wrote, Think of a swing. Apply a slow, steady push, and the swing obediently moves in the direction of the push, although it does not swing very high. Once set in motion, the swing tends to oscillate back and forth at a particular rate known technically as its resonant frequency. Push the swing periodically in time with this swinging and it starts arcing higher. Now try to push at a faster rate and the push goes out of phase with respect to the motion of the swing. At some point your arms might be outstretched with the swing rushing back at you. If you've been pushing for a while, the swing might have enough momentum to knock you over. The swing is then pushing back on you. In the same way, electrons in a material with a negative permittivity go out of phase and resist the push of the electromagnetic field. Such materials include silver, gold, and aluminum, whose resonances usually occur at optical frequencies. The same repulsive force occurs in materials that resonate with the magnetic components of an incoming electromagnetic wave as well. The magnetic permeability mu becomes negative at frequencies slightly above the material's resonant frequency. The material's response, then, is to magnetically resist the magnetic component of the applied electromagnetic wave. Materials that naturally exhibit negative mu domains include ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic materials that exhibit resonances. Such resonances usually occur in frequencies in the gigahertz range and tail off at higher frequencies approaching infrared. The original Project SkyVault setup used cavity magnetron vacuum tubes to generate the microwave source beam, which operated on frequencies ranging from 7 to upwards of 1000 GHz. By comparison, the magnetron tubes used in a microwave oven are 2.54 GHz. The original setup used a metamaterial target made of barium titanate placed in line with the source beam. Further experiments discovered that using sawtooth wave patterns were ideal for maximizing the effect, so specially shaped cavity magnetrons were designed that would generate more perfect sawtooth waves. It was also discovered that waveforms exhibiting a sharper rise and more gradual fall would produce an attractive force, while waveforms exhibiting a gradual rise and sharp fall would exhibit a repulsive force. To understand the reason for this, we must go back to the swing analogy and think about the timing and mechanics for how you would generate the largest reaction force from the oscillating swing, and then apply that concept to the resonating atoms inside the material. 
Eventually, various experiments were performed using a test craft made of barium titanate mounted on a rig resting above a microwave-emitting source beam. The beam being supplied by a more efficient diode-based emitter rather than a cavity magnetron. The craft was then made to ride on the microwave beam, which could actually supply enough force to overcome gravity and achieve lift. However, they could only get the craft to go about 100 feet high or so because the instabilities such as wind would blow it out of alignment with the source beam, causing it to fall back to Earth. Another interesting point brought up by Dr. La Violette in his book Secrets of Anti-Gravity Propulsion, which I believe should be further investigated, is why the original TV series for Mr. and Mrs. Smith, a show about two top-secret government agents who are married to one another, each without the other one's knowledge, was cancelled, seemingly for no reason, after they aired an episode featuring a top-secret microwave beam project taking place in the Arizona desert. It seems the experiments in the plot of the episode drew a striking resemblance to actual experiments that had taken place at top-secret test facilities. But it's not like we didn't already know that the media was controlled or anything. It's just funny when their direct efforts of censorship backfire against them by directly showing us what they censor and leaving us to ask why. They may control TV, but the World Wide Web is in the hands of the people, and we have the best hackers on our side. So it was back to the drawing board. A unidirectional remote source propulsion beam has a limited range of applications. They needed a self-contained system, something on board the craft. The invention of the gun diode helped immensely to cut down the weight of the beam emission technology, and it was fairly easy to find a range of microwave frequencies that would bounce nicely off of the Earth's surface. However, there was the puzzle of how to get this system to actually produce thrust. Finally, someone figured out that if you added the waves using phase conjugation by splitting the source beam, sending half to the ground and the other half through a metamaterial, while inside the metamaterial, the second beam, known as the pump beam, travels faster than the speed of light due to the structural and electromagnetic properties of the metamaterial. It bounces around inside this metamaterial before being sent to the ground to bounce off the same atom that the original source beam just bounced off of only it does this slightly out of phase in order to exert a force on the ground in a similar manner to the swing analogy mentioned before. The first beam travels back to the metamaterial along the same path as the second beam, only in the opposite direction. The same goes for the second beam, which travels back along the track of the first beam, back to the emitter to be merged with the returning beam 1, which just passed through the metamaterial to converge in phase with the second beam on return. Now what happens here is that while inside the metamaterial, the beam travels a further distance in a shorter amount of time. It also bounces off the walls and transfers a portion of its momentum back into the craft. This provides a net force on the craft equal and opposite the net force applied to the Earth. Then, hopefully with a little luck and a really smart engineer, we can figure out how big we need to make it to get that force to be larger than the force of gravity. But in order to build a craft, we would need omnidirectional thrust, which means there needs to be three of these microwave phase conjugators, and they need to be vectorable as well. The craft would also need to be extremely lightweight, because microwave beam propulsion cannot generate sufficient force to lift a heavy craft. Nevertheless, it is still a viable option for anti-gravity propulsion, even if it's used as a backup system to provide additional maneuverability to a craft. It's also useful for moving satellites from low Earth orbit to geostationary orbit, without having to carry all that extra rocket fuel. This was the reason a small UK company called Satellite Propulsion Research LTD was able to get funding to build a prototype EM drive in the first place. Their technology is very similar to the microwave phase conjugators, only they use semiconductor materials which retard the speed of light rather than propagate it faster, like the metamaterial. Unfortunately, this is all YouTube lets me have time for, so I hope you've come full circle with this and answered a lot of questions people had about how the EM drive works, whether it was real or not, and and what other types of beam propulsion technologies exist that they're just not telling us about. I'll be posting more of the theory and the math on my website. For those of you who haven't checked out the EM drive site, please do so. They have a short page and a PDF on the theory behind their model. For everyone else, just keep learning everything you can about physics and know their future where these craft will be as common as automobiles is not far away. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to rate and leave a comment. Once again, this is Alien Scientist speaking. Please feel free to copy and distribute any of my videos across the internet. Just please be sure to include a link back to my channel. That's all I ask. Thank you. May the truth be with you.